a very potent weather system coming together this Friday evening on the East Coast. This is it right there. This is the formative stage of what could be a very powerful nor'easter. This is a large area of lift, also a frontal system down at the surface, kind of oriented somewhat like that off the Carolinas coast. That's going to be moving towards the northeast this evening. Let's look at the upper level fields. One way we can look at that vertical motion field is with the 500 millibar heights and the Q vector field. This is showing a lot of upward motion from Atlanta, Columbia, northward to Norfolk, Charleston, and Cincinnati. This whole area getting snow at this time. And what we're going to see is that upward motion starting to push out over the warmer waters. Let me run that forward. There, you can kind of see what's going on there. We're going to get that interaction with the warmer waters, the Gulf Stream, and also some amplification of that trough there. That's all setting the stage for a nor'easter tomorrow. Here's what the surface chart looks like late this afternoon. You can see that we don't quite yet have the strong pressure falls. This chart showing about 998 maybe 999 millibars. It's probably actually a little bit lower, but that's expected to tumble quite a bit below 980, 970. And of course, we need 24 millibars in 24 hours to get that meteorological bomb status. And very likely we will be there because the model forecasts were indicating some very stout pressure drops over the next 36 hours. Also developing that area of upward motion in the Appalachians, we've got heavy snow being reported in southern West Virginia, and some of that snow going all the way back towards Indianapolis and even into the Decatur, Illinois area. Extensive cold air advection sweeping through much of the southeastern U.S. all the way down to Florida. Miami reporting a cool 74 at this hour drops to the 50s as you get towards Tallahassee and down to 48 at Atlanta. Further out to the west, ridging covering the Great Plains there from Iowa to West Texas and the western U.S. showing this large plateau high 1040 millibars, this high being supported by extensive trapped cold air in the valleys, and intense radiational cooling at night. Temperatures down into the teens, even with clear skies. Out in the Pacific, we'll take a quick look at that area. Not much going on except for off the British Columbia coast. A little bit of a northerly storm track there. And if we get up into Alaska... High pressure, this is an Arctic high there with temperatures down around minus 30 and some very strong cold air advection working in through Kodiak and the northern Aleutians there. So that's helping to support this cyclone in the Gulf of Alaska. A series of waves along this polar front into Canada. Temperatures continuing to be quite cold through much of Canada. And out in the Atlantic, not very much going on. This outgoing 1028 millibar high around Newfoundland. And of course, our attention circles back towards the Northeast US. All right, let's look at that forecast from the 18Z GFS. There's our system of interest right there. This appears to be kind of a double low. Looks about like that. And if we run that forward, by the way, this is using tropical tidbits. This is a great site, and it's too bad we don't use them more often. Probably will try to remember doing that. But what we see here, that's the double low structure that we saw with the European model back on Wednesday. And also the pressures, 981 millibars dropping off to about 975 off Cape Cod. This looks more in line with what the European model had. The GFS was going for more aggressive deepening. 
So maybe our European model is the one we need to use with these nor'easter systems, or at least, you know, give them a little bit heavier weight. Do we have a meteorological bomb? Well, there's 970. If we go back 24 hours, we've got 990. So it's pretty close. 1004 millibars from 0Z zero zero this evening to... Zero Z tomorrow. That's going to be 29 millibars, so that does qualify as a meteorological bomb if that does play out. So yeah, the system does look a little bit weaker than forecast, and some of those channels on YouTube went nuts earlier this week, and I was careful not to do that. You don't want to jump the gun on these powerful deep weather systems. Because the accuracy that you need to initialize these models more than 48 hours out is just not there. So let's take a look at what we have. Snow bands tracking up from eastern Virginia through the Delmarva up to Long Island, Martha's Vineyard, Connecticut, and up to Boston and Maine. So here's the 24-hour snowfall. I really wish they would not cut this off on the ocean because we do want to see the structure of these bands offshore. Some of these sites try to be a little bit too helpful. Anyway, yeah, I can see 14 or is that 11? I think that might be 11 inches there in Boston and looks like 10 up the coast. And I think I see 12 right there in Atlantic City. Now, another model that I like using a lot is the ARW. That's it right there, the HRW, WRF ARW. Over the years, I've been kind of impressed by the accuracy of that model within the 18 to 24 hour time frame. So yeah, that is getting a little bit too far out there, but we can give it a quick look to see what's going on. So this is the total accumulated snowfall. You can see that band developing there Overnight, around 5 or 6 a.m., tracking right up the coast. And those amounts look to be pretty much in line with the GFS. I see 13 there at Boston, about 10 inches in New York City, maybe a little bit less, and 7 inches down in Delaware. So I think this low has ended up being a little bit further offshore, and we're not really getting the tremendous warm air advection coming inland like we've seen with some systems like the big one in 1993. However, significant snowfalls all the way back to Poughkeepsie into New Hampshire and back into the area just east of Washington, D.C., where they're expecting two inches in the capital city. Now a forecast data source that is often neglected is the Weather Prediction Center. If there's anyone on top of the snowfall situation, it's the hydrometeorologists there. And I think that data is more useful than just looking at model data and hoping it's correct. This is the 50th percentile, so this is pretty much splitting the difference on the most likely outcome. We're seeing that two feet of snow indeed is possible in the Boston area. Back towards New York looks about maybe 8 to 12 inches, somewhere in there, and it falls off rapidly as you go west, only looking at about two inches in Albany. The other problem with this system is going to be the wind field. This should be captured fairly well by the models and of course, the low is pretty far offshore, but pretty strong pressure gradient along the coast. And you can see sustained winds here coming up to about 30 knots in eastern Massachusetts around midday Saturday. And I guess maybe we, yeah, right around there, maybe early evening is when we hit the higher amounts. 30 knots right there sustained down to 20. So that's going to mean gusts up over 30 to 40 for sure. And with that snow on the ground, that's going to mean blizzard conditions. 
And there you got the official forecast for Boston, one to three inches tonight, 13 to 19 for tomorrow, and an additional three to seven Saturday night. So that falls in line pretty closely with the WPC guidance. And there's the warnings for this evening into tomorrow. This is not a very good scheme because we've got pink for winter storm warnings and kind of an orange color for blizzard warnings. Those don't resolve very well, but we can zoom into Boston. And there you go. Blizzard warnings all the way from Maine down into southeastern Connecticut. And this looks interesting. To be honest, I've never really looked at this. Winter Storm Severity Index. And it looks like they rank snow load, ice accumulation, blowing snow, all that stuff. And obviously hitting far eastern Massachusetts very hard. Extreme impacts all the way up into southern Maine. And it looks like maybe grazing the coast there could be some problems. And then we're looking at the major impacts being red right there. Extensive property damage, and you do need to prepare. So this certainly will be a major storm for eastern fringes of New England there. Convective bands, for the most part, remaining offshore, but enough to cause extensive problems inland. That's kind of how it looks from here, and we're seeing fairly good agreement and consistency between the models at this time. I have not looked at the European model, We'll be here all day if we try to look at everything. But I wanted to draw your attention to the most important processes. Now, one of those is the 850 millibar temperature and height. This is just off the surface, about 5,000 feet up. And one thing that we see in the more intense nor'easters is a strong warm air advection corridor coming inland. Now, do we have that with this event? Let's watch that system as it moves up the coast. That's getting up into overnight and into tomorrow. And what we see here is that the strong warm air advection is mostly offshore. Let's go back about three hours. Yeah, there's kind of a brief window where it comes inland, but the flow rapidly backs and we have this northeasterly flow. So that is going to be one mitigating factor. However, there's certainly just enough lift and Pressure falls and upper level support to produce a mess there in New England. And then, of course, once we get into the strong offshore flow, the cold air advection, that will result in improving conditions, some drying, and much colder weather. And that's it for the nor'easter. There's going to be plenty of channels talking about that one. About 90% of us live elsewhere, so we're going to cover those other areas. Let's look at that forecast, checking out the GFS. We can watch that little nor'easter go up the coast. That's going to be tomorrow. Cold wedge there coming in the eastern U.S. You can see the thickness values forming this trough-like appearance. That's a thermal trough, and that represents the core of the coldest air flowing into the eastern U.S., and not so much cold air in the central U.S. I remember God, 1993. Yeah, that's way back there. That was a big superstorm on the East Coast. And that cold air advection actually extended all the way back into Texas, Missouri, and back towards Wisconsin. And that's where the thermal trough was. This one's a little bit closer to the East Coast, so this is somewhat of a more compact system, and we should see a rapid recovery once it's out of the picture. But here is another Alberta Clipper coming out of Canada. We're looking at tomorrow morning here. That Alberta Clipper kind of dives into the Midwest areas. It's a dry system. Minimal cold air advection with that. In fact, the plains remain Kind of warm. You can see some changes up there in Canada for Monday and Tuesday. There's probably some troughing going on up there. You can see lots of precip breaking out. So certainly there's some potent upper level system working through that region. And we get a well-formed cold front. This is not your average 
Alberta Clipper. This is a good push of strong polar air. There's the occluded front there and strong cold air advection coming into the Dakotas for Tuesday. Now it looks like we've got some southwesterly flow, so that cold air is not going to barrel southward. If we look at the thickness lines, we can make out a southern stream. So we're going to have a southern jet there. We're going to get some overrunning, some warm air advection coming up from Texas, and that will produce some wintry weather in the central U.S. for Wednesday. Eventually that cold air does blow southward, and look at those pressures, 1051 millibars. Now that's 130 hours out, so we're not 100% sure on that, but if we are at 1050 millibars, that's significant. That should be enough to bust that cold air all the way to the Gulf. And the model picking up some wintry weather all the way down to Texas for Thursday, and eventually that cold air is like a big steamroller moving south into the eastern U.S. and the Atlantic. And here comes another burst of cold air for the weekend. That's got the potential to be pretty strong as well, 1050 millibars indicated. So that will be something to watch. That could be leading us into a very cold start to February. Yeesh, okay. Anyway, we'll look at that next week. One last look at our nor'easter starting to form off the Carolinas at this hour. And I'm getting ready to wrap this episode up and get it uploaded so you can enjoy it. That's a classic bear clinic leaf there. That's the incipient phase of a strong frontal system. And that's well before it goes into the mature and occluded stages. And back behind it, some strong downward motion. So there are some strong jet stream dynamics working into the southeastern U.S. And as we saw for the opening of the program, those upper level processes are going to interact with this system and help remove mass and result in deepening as it moves out into the Atlantic. And that's all for this edition of Forecast Lab. I want to thank Owen Broadwater, our newest Patreon supporter. Thank you for helping to keep this program going. And I hope you all have a great weekend. And we'll see you back here Monday for the supporters and Wednesday for everybody else. Take care. Bye-bye.